Bibles aren't open, go back to John 17, and we want to look at this first portion of our Lord's high priestly prayer. Several headings that I want to set up for you regarding these first five verses, and they all have to do with the emphasis uh, or subject matter of Christ's prayer, the things he prays for, why he prays, purposes that are at work here, even relationship uh, that he has with his Father. And I'll try to uh, give you those major headings, make it obvious, because I know some of you like to take notes, as I do, and not having those things printed out for you or projected on a screen can sometimes make it a little difficult and frustrating. But as we look at verse 1 together, as Jesus speaks these particular words recorded by John, lifting his eyes to heaven, he writes, then he says, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you. Here's heading number one. Jesus prays for the glory of the Father. Now, he prays, first of all, in relationship to the Father. That may seem self-evident, but as you read through this chapter, there are two other occasions where he refers to him, verse 11, as Holy Father. He refers to him in verse 25 as Righteous Father. But that family relationship, that intimacy that he enjoys, the inter-Trinitarian fellowship that remains unbroken at this point is uppermost, and so he is praying in relationship to the Father. Uh, there's a second sub-point there that I want you to, to notice. He is praying in respect to the mission given him by the Father. He says the hour has come. If you've read through the Gospel of John, you would probably remember that there's a little bit of a theme that emerges with this one word, hour, and it first occurs at that first miracle recorded in chapter 2, where at the wedding of Cana, his mother makes an appeal and says the wedding party uh, ha has run out of the celebratory beverage. And he says to his mother, my hour has not yet come. He says in chapter 7, verses 6 and 8, my time or my hour has not yet come. He says in chapter 8, verse 20, his hour had not yet come. And so there's a little bit of an expectation that begins to build as you read the Gospel of John. First of all, what is this hour that he's referring to? And then he begins to drop significant clues and hints along the way that the hour has to do with his impending death. As Jesus entered Jerusalem at the beginning of this very week, Holy Week as we refer to it, the triumphal entry signaled a, a turn, if you will. But at the very beginning of the Holy Week, Gentiles come... And remember, they find Philip and Andrew, and they say to them, we would see Jesus. And so Andrew and Philip then go to Jesus and say, there's some Gentiles or Greeks who are here to see you. And Jesus responds in John 12, verse 23, with the words, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. He then goes on in verse 27 of that same chapter to say, my soul is troubled, what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this purpose I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. So the time or the hour that is spoken of here in Christ's prayer is more than just a moment and a schedule. Rather, it is the appointed hour for the accomplishment of a very specific work laid down before the foundation of the world. That God's appointed hour has arrived does not strike Jesus as an excuse for resigned fatalism, as one commentator writes, but for prayer, precisely because the hour has come for the Son to be glorified. He prays that the glorification might take place. As so often in Scripture, emphasis on God's sovereignty functions as an incentive to prayer, not disincentive. And let me pause to make a very practical word of application that the sovereign purposes of God that are at work right now in our world, and they are unfolded for us in those grand promises that fill the Scriptures from Genesis to Revelation, those must be those sovereign motives for our own prayers. Stop reading the headlines 
and immersing yourself in all the trouble and all the turmoil, all the unknowns. Immerse yourself in the unchangeable, sovereign promises of God and let that kindle a fire within your soul to breathe out similar prayers to your Father. God's sovereignty never disincentivizes our prayers just like it should never disincentivize our evangelism. God's called us to a a wide open harvest field right now. And many people say, isn't Utah challenging? Sure it is. Less than 3% of the population in Utah would would fall under the heading of born again evangelical Christian. It's like a stateside unreached people group. And I'm going to tell you that some of the conversations that unfold there are really challenging. And some of the hearts seem so hard. Like they're these impregnable fortresses of disbelief and unbelief or a, a, a different kind of faith that is just as destructive for the soul. But you know what? The Lord has made promises, some of which I think Christ's prayer are, are reflective of, and we'll come to those in just a moment, where we labor in the hopeful expectation that Jesus will claim his inheritance. So the sovereignty of God becomes a a very reason that Jesus prays. The hour has come. It's an hour of betrayal by his dear friend Judas. It's an hour of false accusation by the Pharisees. It's an hour of condemnation by Caiaphas, an hour of brutalization by the Roman guard, an hour of humiliation at the hands of Pilate, and execution on the appointed cross by both Jews and Gentiles and characters like Herod. But it is also the hour of salvation and rescue for sinners. It's the hour when Jesus, who himself knew no sin, will be made sin for us an hour of purification, an hour of atonement, an hour of rescue, an hour of redemption, and and an hour when he will actually conquer that great enemy death and rise from a real grave on the third day. And so he prays in respect to the mission given him by the Father. He also prays in respect to the glory of the Father, and here we come to the main point. Glory is a word that throughout scriptures has to do with weight, substance. Just two weeks ago, we had the privilege of participating in the retirement ceremony of a brigadier general, a Green Beret, who is a friend of ours and member of our church. And as his 34-year career was summarized through stories and testimonies and awards and honors given to him, conferred upon him uh, at that ceremony, Photos of his training and service of combat deployments around the world. The weight of what this man had accomplished. The weight of his personal service for our nation. The weight of the call upon his life settled on all of our hearts. And at the conclusion of the ceremony, there was this fabulous montage of photos rolling across the screen from those 34 years from when he was a young recruit in basic training until those last days of active service and the legendary theme song the ballad of the green berets played any of you familiar with that yeah some of you would be and the rest of you should familiarize yourself with it a very simple tune and a very simple but profound text and as we watched that montage of photos, and listened to the Ballad of the Green Beret, and in particular came to the last two stanzas that I don't, I don't have memorized, but I wrote them down and I want to read them to you. This is like the testimony of a Green Beret himself. Back at home, a young wife waits. Her Green Beret has met his fate. He has died for those oppressed, leaving her his last request. And here it is. Put silver wings on my son's chest. Make him one of America's best. He'll be a man they'll test one day. Have him win the Green Beret. I'm telling you, there wasn't a dry eye in the room at that particular tune. He felt the weight of of a life well lived. And to that end, we might say that it was a glorious ceremony. 
because it was a reflection of a life that was lived for a just cause and a, a glorious purpose, humanly speaking. How much more the weight of this son's life at this moment, and yet as he is praying, first for his own glory, but it's with a view that he would return that glory to the Father. You see, there's something, something infinitely weightier here than even the most noble or heroic earthly figure we might put forward. Here is the one-of-a-kind Son of God praying, first of all, Father, glorify your Son. That is, honor me, invest me with that divine dignity. Clothe me in a kind of splendor that others would see something that needs to be made conspicuous. Honor me in the coming hours with that cup of suffering that I'm about to dr drain dry. Honor me in the death I am about to die that others may see your infinite worth. Honor me in the atoning work I'm about to accomplish as priest and sacrifice. Honor me so that, look at the text, the Son may glorify you. So even his work in the coming hours as he would go to the cross and bear the, the wrath of Almighty God, bear the weight of our sins and the reproach and humiliation and death itself, all of that was with a view that he might demonstrate to us the infinite worth or weight of the Father. What a prayer. If we could fill this out in its larger context, that here the Son is coming to that watershed moment, praying that the sacrifice he is about to make would be invested with glory so that as he is the sin bearer and bears the weight of God's wrath, people like us might say, the Father is glorious. Let my agony, Father, show the world the weight of your holiness and righteousness as I bear that condemnation. Let my blood that is about to be shed display the wonders of your saving grace. The weight of this gospel as a fountain is open for the cleansing of guilty sinners. Glorify your son that the son may glorify you. So Jesus is praying for the Father's glory. Second of all, he's praying from the authority given to him by the Father. From the authority given him by the Father. Look at verse 2. Since you have given him authority over all flesh. Now let's pause right there. I'm going to touch briefly on this. But I want you to think a little further in these few minutes here as to what kind of authority has been given and for the purpose. Now, there is a little term here, since. Some of your English translations might even use the two words, just as. And that term marks a parallel thought to verse 1, and I'll try to tie this together. The thought from verse 1 is, or this is the request, glorify your son so that the Son may glorify you. And now he is continuing that prayer by saying, just as you have given him authority over all flesh, so that, and most of your English translations would say too, but it's actually the same little uh, preposition there. Give eternal life to all whom you have given him. So first of all, the Father is given a sovereign authority, authority over all flesh, authority to rule. Authority to rule humanity. That's who's in view here. That's what the term all flesh uh, refers to. It, it frequently has reference to humanity in its fallen nature. Those who have rebelled. Those who actually demonstrate their need of some kind of authority. And man, doesn't our world demonstrate that at this very hour? Uh, who on planet Earth really leads a nation, a city, 
a state, a community, in the way it longs to be led. I mean, most of us are just saying, where is the common sense? Please, please, somebody who lives a normal life in the real world, make a policy. Yeah. Well, here's one who has been given authority to rule rebel humanity. Now, wouldn't you expect the Holy God and Father at that particular moment to grant authority to his Holy Son to judge, condemn, and punish those who are rebels? That would make a lot of sense. And there are a lot of bad characters in the world today that we kind of wish would be steamrolled by somebody, right? I mean, let's be honest. Where's the justice? There's a wicked character on the other side of the world today who's creating a lot of chaos because he's got an ego out of control. If he were submitted and surrendered to Jesus, it'd be a very different scenario on the global stage tonight, wouldn't it? But look at the purpose for which this authority has been given. It's a saving purpose. The Father has not only given sovereign authority to the Son, but he's given him a saving purpose. You have given him authority over all flesh, too, for the purpose of giving eternal life to all whom you have given him. So appreciated uh, what, let me open my notes here, because I, I, I jotted it down when, when, when Jared referred to uh, what the Lord had done. See if I can find it here. Yeah, he's given us the only kind of life he has the only kind of life within him eternal life think about that one author writes that purpose in his life death and resurrection was to glorify god and to bring the promise of eternal life and salvation to the world aren't you glad that the sovereign authority given to jesus is not simply an authority to bring absolute justice because all of us, without exception, all of us would be steamrolled. All of us would be separated from God forever. All of us would be separated from one another forever. All of us would experience the unquenchable fire of his wrath forever. But he was given authority to give eternal life. So Jesus is praying that just as the Father gifted him with sovereign authority that will result in the salvation of all those that have been gifted to Jesus, so the Father will now glorify the Son in order that the Son may in turn glorify the Father. Do you see how that begins to fit together? There's some, there's some really deep and eternal purposes at work here. But Jesus is praying from the authority that was given him by the Father. Number three, verse three. Jesus prays a gospel promise. I was intrigued earlier this week in, in studying and reading through some commentaries that some like to refer to verse three as a parenthesis. And, and I can see that as you look at it. I mean, it, it is a little different from verses one and two. And this is eternal life. It's almost like we push the pause button and now... You know, here's a uh, systematic theology lesson. So let's put a clear definition on this. And it is a definition. Jesus is revealing what eternal life is. But I, w I don't want you to think of it just as a little uh, theological parenthesis inserted in the middle of a prayer. No, it actually fits into the whole of what Jesus is praying and the message that John has recorded for us. Because Jesus here is revealing eternal life personally. Now, when I say that Jesus reveals eternal life personally, look at the next phrase. This will help you understand it. Here is, this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. That, focus on that little phrase, that they may know you. And then say it this way, that they may know you. And those are the two components I want you to look at for just a moment here. That concept of knowing God as it has appeared in John's gospel as well as throughout the scriptures means to know a person through direct personal experience. And there is an implication 
of a continuing relationship that comes as a result of that knowledge. Now, that's exactly what John has been saying from the opening chapters. And if you go back and look at John 1, verse 18, he says very simply, I'm reading from the NIV, no one has ever seen God, but the one and only Son, who is himself God and, and is in closest relationship with the Father, he has made him known. So when Jesus prays, and includes this phrase, this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God. I think some of that prayer is a reflection of what he has accomplished. Because as John described for us in chapter 1, the word was made flesh and made his dwelling among us. I mean, he just, he camped in the middle of us, set up his home in the midst of us. And he says, and we beheld his glory, glorious of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John, even in writing this gospel, a number of years after he had walked with Jesus and seen him crucified, rise from the dead, ascend on high in glory, was still overwhelmed by this experience, this knowledge, if you will, that the God of eternity, the infinite, eternal, omniscient, uh, omnipotent, omnipresent God came to earth as a man, initially in the womb of an earthly mother, and then birthed into the world, grew in wisdom and stature uh, before God, as, as Luke 2 describes. That means he's learning through his toddler years what life in a body really includes. He's growing in wisdom, growing in submission to his earthly parents, growing in his understanding of what it means to work in a, a carpenter shop and to meet deadlines, growing in his capacity to sympathize with us as this merciful high priest as he too feels the the coming the looming deadline of taxes being due of weddings to attend of friendships to tend of disciples to make and then a ministry emerges when he's about 30 years old daily he knows the grind and the pressure of doing the father's will and so to some extent, he's not simply asking that people would know God in order to gain eternal life. He has been revealing God, making God come near. You know, if Jesus had never done this, how would we know God? Oh, he could have, he could have authored and printed a comprehensive systematic theology, dropped it on planet Earth, with the instructions to print a bajillion copies for every generation. And, and to that extent, we could have known about God. But he's not interested in limiting our knowledge in that way. And he's not interested in you or me tonight just knowing a number of facts about He's interested in bringing you into experiential knowledge, relational knowledge, transformational knowledge. The union with Christ that we heard touched on earlier and we'll probably have unpacked more fully tomorrow, that's knowledge you can't find in a textbook. That's knowledge designed to draw you personally near as you enter a personal relationship. For three years, he's lived in intimate relationship with his disciples and dozens of others who've seen it all, heard it all, and felt it all. And my friend, if you are here tonight and never, you, you may know a lot about Jesus, you may know a lot about the gospel, but if you've never entered into a personal relationship with him, tonight's the night. You're standing outside the house, so to speak, and Jesus is saying, get in here. You want to know what God thinks about you right now? Listen to my word. You want to know how God feels about people who are lost in their immo immorality? Watch how I interact with people, immoral people in the gospels. 
You want to know how I feel about those who are physically infirm, bound up by diseases for decades with no, no sense of where to go for healing or what to do? Look at how I deal with those people. No, God. So Jesus reveals eternal life personally. He's doing more than just defining it. He's lived it out. But he also reveals eternal life perfectly. Did you notice in the phrase that they may know you, the only true God? That's an exclusive statement, isn't it? It's not uncommon in our context for people to say, well, we really believe the same thing, and we, we really kind of believe in the same God, don't we, after all? And that's where I just you know, call a little time out and say, can we talk about that? Because your Jesus and my Jesus are very different. It's a little, by, a little bit like when Jesus asked his disciples that question that's recorded in Matthew 16. Who do people say that I am? And the, and, the, and the disciples give a variety of answers, don't they? Some say you're a prophet. Some say you're John the Baptist. Some say you're Elijah. But that's not actually who Jesus is, is it? And then he makes it very personal and says, but who do you say that I am? And Peter, ever ready to give an answer and jump in, says, you are the Christ, the Son of God. And Jesus says, blessed are you, Simon, son of John. Flesh and blood has not revealed that to you. Oh, he got the right answer, but more than just having the right answer, it was a reflection that he had entered into this knowledge. He had entered into this personal relationship with Jesus and saw him for who he was. And because he knew the only God and Jesus who is the only Messiah, we may be confident that he's entered into this eternal life of which Jesus speaks here tonight. Jesus reveals eternal life perfectly. Well, let's press on to verses 4 and 5. So that was more than just a parenthesis. It's an important piece of the prayer. And I think it would include a sense of rejoicing in what he has done to reveal eternal life and also what would come. And, and we know that because of the direction the prayer goes. And this will just get us a, a, a couple of steps further and we'll have to resume this tomorrow. But look at verses 4 and 5 with me. For Jesus here prays for the full restoration of shared glory with the Father. Look at verse 4. I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. Now in one sense we could say that what Jesus did was a partial revelation of the glory of God. It's fully accurate at every part of it, but there's so much more to Jesus than what he was actually able to reveal in the days of his uh, earthly ministry, in the days of his incarnation. I glorified you on earth, though he gets specific, having accomplished the work. Well, what was the work? Well, if you were to go back to John 1 and look at verse 14, I think you would begin to see something unfold here. The word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. So the revelation of God's glory... In particular, glory is of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. So we could say, in a, in a broad sense, the work that Jesus was called to do was to make God known, to make his perfect character and his perfect attributes conspicuous. And the work was a work of revealing him. John does something unique with the miracles that is different from the synoptics. There are many more listed in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. John chooses seven primary miracles they begin at cana and he even makes a little note there if you go back to john 2 and look at verse 11 where john says what jesus did here in cana of galilee and this was the water to wine miracle was the fir first of the signs through which he revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him so here he is performing miracles in order to reveal the glory of God. Now, there were seven particular signs. First one here in chapter 2, water to wine. Then in chapter 4, the official son who was at the point of death, if you remember that story, and Jesus heals that young boy. Then in chapter 5, the lame man at the pool of Bethesda who had been a paralytic for 38 years. We don't know the reasons for that, but 38 years he lies helplessly by the pool until the day that Jesus arrives. 
Then you come to chapter 6, and he feeds 5,000. Chapter 6, he walks on the water, calms the storm. And then chapter 9, the man born blind. You might be able to find some kind of explanation if you worked really hard, or even some magician who could duplicate you know, water to wine or a few other things, but this is of a different category, isn't it? And what glory is he revealing? That he is the creator God who first formed the eyeballs, put two of them in your head, that actually work together. It's one more reason. I, I cannot believe any theory of macroevolution. Study the eyeball and then come back to me and, and tell me it's reasonable that over a period of time, all of that in tandem came to be. No. A wise, infinite, almighty creator God who now appears in flesh, thought it up, created it, flipped the switch, and that's the reason most of you are looking at me in 3D vision tonight, high def. Some of you not so high def at your age anyway, right now. <laughs> I remember the first time that my, my eyes failed me in the pulpit. And uh, I was, I, I think I was about 42. And I stood up to preach, and I could not see my notes from the normal distance. It was a blur. And it, it was a terrifying moment. And I, and I stepped back about arm's length, and it came back into focus, and I you know, silently praised the Lord, but thought to myself, here I am. Time, time to get glasses. And I went through readers initially and would do that, you know, off, on, off, on thing while preaching or teaching. And, and finally, people in the congregation persuaded me to, to, you know, go to the doctor, get a set of glasses. And so here I am, uh, happy, happy that, that I can see. But it's still a marvel. And so here is this man who's been born blind, and, and Jesus heals him. And oh, what a firestorm it sets up. He's revealing the glory of God. And then finally, he comes to the tomb of his friend Lazarus, and he calls him forth from the dead. And as John records, the man who was dead came out. Who is this one? He's God in flesh, he's the revealer of God, the giver of knowledge that leads to eternal life. Every sermon he preached in the open air, every lesson he taught in the synagogue, every miracle he worked in Galilee, every conversation with the disciples as they walked the dusty roads of Judea, every private prayer on the hillsides of Tiberias glorified the Father as Jesus perfectly exegeted his character and work. And just ahead of him is the final chapter, if you will, for revealing the glory of the Father. For on the cross, Jesus will take the sins of the world and make them his very own. He will bear God's wrath for sin. He will cleanse the hearts of his people from every sin. He will display the glory of redemption, the weight of salvation. And then three days later from the tomb, Jesus will signal that death is dead and believers who have put their faith in him are justified eternally. And that, I believe, is what that little phrase, accomplished the work, has reference to. I fully agree. Jared stole this from me. Uh, accomplished is the same terminology as that we translate, it is finished. glorious to think that Jesus accomplished everything necessary for your salvation and mine. And he's praying as if it's already done, and isn't that sweet? I mean, it's very dramatic what's going to unfold, and as you walk with Jesus through Gethsemane, through the betrayal, through the trial, all the way up to Calvary, I mean, I, many of us grew up hearing it, and we've read it so many times, we know how it ends, but if you've never read that story, you have a sense all the way through it that Maybe it's going to unravel. It looks like it's unraveling. The disciples have scattered. People deny him. He's accused. He's condemned. He's crucified. He's on mission doing everything the Father entrusted to him.
It is interesting to me to think that as he prays, that the work is accomplished. I cannot help but wonder how many sick and lame and blind and leprous people still need to be healed. And aren't there more sermons that need to be preached in the outlying villages? And isn't there more instruction that those now 11 disciples need before they go do the Great Commission work? His mom is still widowed, in need of care and attention. There's a young Pharisee named Saul who needs to be confronted and converted. Cities beyond Israel's borders that need the gospel, places to go, churches to plant, foreigners like an Ethiopian eunuch who need to know what Isaiah 53 is all about. Yes, yes, all of that is true. And yet at this moment, Jesus is saying, I've accomplished a work. Isn't it interesting that not even the Messiah has a Messiah complex? Some of you carry significant responsibility in your family or in the context of a church or maybe you're in, in a school or a hospital facility or a company and a lot rests on you and even getting here tonight was a struggle for you. Saying, I have so much to do. How can I carve out time in a Friday night? And, and even this is like a prayer of faith. Like, oh, Lord, it just uh, maybe I should go back to the office or maybe I should get back in the study and work on that Sunday school lesson a little more. Maybe, but maybe not. The real question is, what does the Father have for you? And despite all those needs, Jesus can say, I finished the work. Well, let's press on. Verse 5, now he anticipates the restoration of full glory. It's been a partial glory to this point. Verse 5, and now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. Oh, what glory this was. If you were to turn back to John 12 and look at verse 41, John points us back to Isaiah. Actually says Isaiah spoke these, he has just quoted a portion of Isaiah and says, Isaiah said these things because he saw his glory and spoke of him. I think it's easy to draw a line straight back to Isaiah 6. Tells us in the year that King Uzziah died, this is Isaiah speaking, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up. The train of his robe filled the temple Above him stood the seraphim, each had six wings. With two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the thresholds shook at the voice of him who called. And the house was filled with smoke. The majestic greatness of this king was visibly displayed before Isaiah in this vision of glory. It seems even from what Isaiah describes that he cannot even raise his gaze above the hem of the robe, which is so glorious, it fills the heavenly temple. The earth which he created is described by Isaiah as being full of his glory from the and you think about planet Earth, and it is glorious. From the frigid, darkened depths of the Marianas Trench to the frozen, sun-drenched heights of Everest, from subatomic particles like protons and quarks, which remain invisible to our human eyes, to blue whales, a hundred feet long with a lung capacity of 5,000 liters and weighing nearly 200 tons. And yet they glide majestically through the oceans of the world. And while they do, all the while, cry in their own way. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. Yet so many of us, the greater creation, because we are created in the image of God, created for relationship with him, created to be in daily fellowship, to enjoy that union that was spoken of just a little while ago and that we'll explore in depth tomorrow. 
we who were created for an intimate, personal, eternal life relationship with this God are often blind to him, deaf to him, never occurs to us as we entertain ourselves with vapid choices off of YouTube or, or streaming television or whatever sources that this God is holy three times over living our lives as if there is no creator to whom we're accountable, let alone should be rightly related to. No wonder that Christ pray, prays from the depths of his soul, Oh, Father, let this glory that I knew and enjoyed with you before the foundation of the world be restored. It's not been lost. It's just been temporarily laid aside, if you will, as Philippians 2 tells us. But Jesus anticipates the restoration of full glory with the Father. And this is not in the verses I've been assigned, but a little preview. Verse 24, he's actually going to pray that we would be with him, that we too might see the glory. So it's not just about, Father, I really miss the good old days. No, it's Father. We know what we are. These people that are so dear to my heart, these people that I am in the process of saying, saving, they need to be there. Make it happen. The restoration of his glory does not happen independently of our experience of his glory. So here we are again, brought to a place of seeing that this most intimate prayer of the Son with the Father has eternal purposes at work. Yes, there is something very personal just between the two of them. Yes, but you, if you are a child of God, are at the very heart of Christ's prayer. And as was stated earlier, and I would reinforce, this is not just a prayer that we are outside observers listening and observing and learning through things. This is something that the Spirit of God, through this authoritative word that John penned for us so long ago, is intended to draw us in and put us in awe of the fact that this high priest is praying for us. This is the glory that Jesus is praying for. Let's pray together. Father, it is only because of Christ that we have the privilege of praying with that term, invoking your presence as our Abba. It is only because of Christ that we have spiritual eyes to see. It's only because of Christ that our hearts have been made tender to receive this living word. It's only because of Jesus that we could enjoy such a mercy of your justification knowing that despite our sin, you have declared us righteous forever. A thousand more blessings and benefits that are ours in Christ. All glory goes to him. Thank you. And we thank you for this holy word. Thank you for preserving the gracious, powerful, personal prayer of Jesus, our Savior, our Messiah our priest, our king. Here at the end of a long week, there are many here tonight who are weary, both in body and in spirit. Renew them through this abiding word. We pray that the presence of Christ and the ministry of his word, the presence of the spirit through this night, would have expulsive power, not just of our fatigue, but of our sin. That we, even in direct answer to Christ's prayer, would experience that sanctification, that intimacy of union. Thank you for the gift that a weekend such as this is. Bless every part of it. Save, restore, 
strengthen, heal us. And we pray that with joy and confident expectation because there is one who ever lives to pray for us. We thank you, Father. We praise you, Jesus. We bless you, Spirit. Amen.